Good afternoon. Uh, hope, I hope you had a lovely lunch. And, <laughs> but we need to talk about Rossetti's a bit further. So, <laughs> my name is Eduardo De Maio. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of York, and I'm delighted to chair this last session of papers of this conference. Yeah, and the, the panel is titled International Exchange, International Exchanges, sorry. And the aim of this, of this panel is to present the Rossettis, the impact of the Rossettis, the presence of the Rossettis, not only in Britain. So we need to go beyond the channel and explore the world and analyze the Rossettis on a global perspective. And I am very delighted to uh, introduce our uh, three panelists. First of all, I would like to start with Helena Cox from the University of York, where she is currently finishing her PhD, and she's also curator of the art collection of the university. And she's presenting a paper called Checking Out the Rossettis. I absolutely love the pun. <laughs> Artistic and literary networks uh, mediating pre Raphaelite art in 1900 Czech lands. Please welcome Helena. Thank you so much, Eduardo, and thank you everyone who made it here after lunch. And um, I'm determined to keep everybody awake uh, for our wonderful panel that will be hopefully the climax of the conference, which has been absolutely fantastic so far. So it's such a great honor uh, to be here. And also thank you so much for accepting my quirky title. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure whether I could pull this off at such an esteemed institutions like the Tate and Paul Mellon and, and the University of York, so I'm absolutely delighted that I could. So to start with, I um, want to do a little introduction to tell you um, kind of uh, an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So what I'm looking at in my talk is I'm looking at uh, different ways that British art was disseminated and mediated in the Czech lands. By the term Czech lands, and sometimes I will also be using the term Bohemia, I mean basically the area that is the nowadays uh, Czech Republic, so no longer Czechoslovakia, but Czech Republic. At the time uh, of my interest, around the 1900s, uh, this area was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, which followed on from the Austrian Empire, which was in place uh, before. So although I will be looking at Czech artists and their uh, first language would have been Czech, they were living at a, um, an environment which was dominated by German culture, uh, Austrian culture and German German language. So all of these artists were at least bilingual in uh, Czech and German. I will be looking specifically at Czech art journals at the time as important mediators of pre-Raphaelite uh, art uh, to uh, the Czech lands. And I'm specifically interested in the networks around these journals, because these journals consisted of artists, editors, critics and translators. And sometimes all these roles were embodied by one person. So there were certain artists that translated and uh, wrote uh, uh, criti criticisms and uh, uh, kind of brought uh, art critical reviews of exhibitions worldwide while also producing their own art that was reproduced uh, in these papers. Uh, in this paper, I'm specifically looking at the Czech-British interaction, uh, mostly one directional, so from Britain to Czech lands or to Bohemia. But it needs to be said that this needs to be understood in a wider international context. So there were multiple influences, for, for lack of a better term for the, for the moment, um, of, uh, of international art uh, over the area of uh, the Czech lands. So while I will be focusing on Britain, at the same time, there was a massive influx of uh, artistic inspiration from France. As I said, German culture was incredibly dominant. So I will be kind of handpicking uh, the uh, pre predominantly pre-Raphaelite inspirations, but do bear in mind that this is in a very um, international context. I want to say a few words about the methods uh, through which I'm trying to access uh, these, uh, these ideas. And uh, some of them will mirror in how I'm uh, looking at things. So I've been working quite a lot with issues of cultural appropriation in the arts and kind of the value of artistic products uh, when they are uh, created using cultural appropriation. And this is especially because, especially when it comes to former Eastern Europe, and I obviously prefer the term Central Europe for the Czech lands, but a lot of people do 
do call, call that uh, Eastern Europe, and there is not an agreement even, even among scholars of this geographic region of whether this is Central Europe or Eastern <laughs> Europe. So very often there is this belief when it comes to art of Eastern Europe uh, that somehow uh, the idea of a delay in reception of international trends and the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the derivativeness of the artwork somehow makes art of this region uh, slightly lesser uh, in their value in comparison to to, to the kind of centres where artwork uh, of higher quality was produced, such as uh, Britain and London, as opposed to uh, Czechlands and Prague. So to combat this, um, uh, using um, I'm working with the text of uh, Canadian philosopher James O. Young, who is looking at cultural appropriation, which is inverted. So sorry, I think I've just <laughs> uh, which is inverted. So from a weaker culture, although I don't like that term, uh, to uh, from a stronger culture to a weaker culture. So the kind of ethical uh, thought that often is associated with cultural appropriation doesn't really work the same in that direction. But I'm also working with the Polish scholar Piotr Piotrowski, who in two. 2008, uh, published an article in a Czech art historical magazine, and the article was called "On the Spatial Turn of, uh, of, of On the Spatial Turn or Horizontal Art History," in which he was determined to kind of dismantle the idea of of the hierarchy of centers and peripheries and replace that with a much more horizontal structure. And finally, I'm looking at how this was reflected in the work of a um, British scholar uh, currently based in Brno in the Czech Republic. Matthew Rumpley, and his article, which came out in just in 2021, uh, with the uh, evocative title of Networks, Horizons, Centres and Peripheries, The Challenges of Writing on Modernism in Central Europe, uh, in which he's kind of reflecting on the fact that even so many years after Piotrowski's article and after the idea of horizontal art history has been kind of accepted by many, uh, Still, the art from uh, from Central and Eastern Europe is not has not been made part uh, of the kind of major canon of canon of uh, art history, and as a result of that, I shall now move to into more image based part of my presentation. Uh, a lot of the artists, or I would say all of the artists that uh, that I will be showing here, that are Czech artists, you might not have heard of before or seen uh, their images. And I'm kind of partly asking why is that, and I'm so grateful that this conference is giving platform to these artists and making them part of a larger story of pre-Raphaelitism. So to start with, a very important year for me is actually the year 1900 uh, and the event of Ruskin's death. Uh, this was a major catalyst for Bohemian art journals and for the, for the way they opened up to British culture. And to start with, I want to read you um, a quotation from an article by the uh, Czech writer and literary critic uh, Gustav Jaros, uh, who wrote the obituary of John Ruskin for one of the leading magazines, uh, art magazines around the time of 1900s, called Volnes Mere Free Directions. And this is what he wrote, uh, writes, uh, I quote, the legendary Chinese wall against foreign literature, which used to encircle our dear Czech lands, is said to have been torn down, someone declared recently. We, however, politely beg to differ, or at least we are ready to admit that the wall has been torn down on uh, torn down on the borders with certain countries only, such as with the French. But not even the most flamboyant self-applause could disguise the fact that the wall still stands sturdy and solid, for example, against the culture of England. How immensely sturdy this Chinese wall must be between Czech lands and England when news of John Ruskin is only now beginning to bashfully appear in patchy reports after 50 years of his grand, legendary and deeply meaningful work. And Ruskin is not the only one who, until yesterday, or even today, remained completely unknown to the good old little Czech people. What an immense number of people that had been in England over the last 50 years. Poets, philosophers, painters, sculptors, journalists, whose names do we not yet recognize at all in the minds of Czech readers. The Chinese wall is indeed still towering with many levels over the Czech lands, and it will take many diligent workers and numerous to tools to get it completely dismantled. End of quote. I very much hope that I'm becoming one of these tools that are helping to dismantle this wall. So here what you see is an image of John Ruskin by the Czech artist František Tavík Šimon. Uh, this is from 1903, and I'm kind of showing a younger version of Ruskin by Millet, which is um, not the kind of Ruskin that the Czech people would, would open their eyes to, because they would be really focusing on uh, his, his much older incarnation as embodied by uh, František Tavík Šimon. 
I mentioned that the importance uh, of the uh, art, histor art, art journals uh, Czech, written in Czech was really transformative when it came to bringing news of uh, the Pre-Raphaelite and their art into uh, kind of Czech uh, consciousness. And what is really interesting that I'm look is that I'm looking at specifically at the connections between articles and illustrations as both looking at both as modes of cultural transfer. So I'm looking at the individual issues of these uh, magazines and trying to decipher a link between the poetry that was shown in these uh, the uh, texts, the translations, and also uh, the imagery. So here, for example, is the Czech translation of some of the works of Ruskin from 1899. And uh, next to it was a poem by Julius Zayer, uh, a Czech poet who did uh, kind of feature characters from Shakespeare as well in his poetry, so a connection to, to British culture, and illustrations by uh, Jan Preisler, one of the artists that were in the forefront of kind of taking in this inspiration from pre-Raphaelite art. Um, again here we're looking at uh, pictures by uh, Jan Preisler. Uh, he was predominantly a painter but for Volnes Mieri, Free Directions for the journal, um, they mainly reproduced his sketches and his illustrations in charcoal or uh, in pencil. Uh, so in here we are looking at uh, his illustrations that were used uh, specifically and intentionally with uh, an article about Ruskin. And uh, I came across this in interesting comparison with, with, with Mille so the series of illustrations that were used for this article about Ruskin, and when I'm speaking about Ruskin, in every single article about Ruskin in uh, Czech 1900s journals, they, he is always connected to the pre-Raphaelites. So uh, I should have maybe said that, pointed out uh, earlier, every single occurrence in Ruskin is also linked to uh, a propagation and, and celebration of the pre-Raphaelites. So he was very clearly understood as somebody who was pushing the pre-Raphaelites forward as if to the Czech audience who also didn't really, by the 1900s, properly reflect it uh, on their work. So the, here is a really interesting kind of visual uh, similarity between uh, the main character in Jan Preisler uh, in the series of, of illustrations, uh, this young man with a very similar hairstyle to Millais uh, Ferdinand, and this whole series of illustrations that um, are uh, kind of weaved through the article on Ruskin, uh, they all feature this character interacting with various kind of mythical creatures and uh, women embodying this kind of fairy-like atmosphere, so a nice uh, nice little connotation. Uh, Preisler was, was fascinated by the work of Byrne Jones and Rossetti, and again, bones, both Byrne Jones and Rossetti uh, would be people who would be always mentioned when it came to Ruskin. So the flurry of articles surrounding Ruskin's death uh, all very strongly promoted both Byrne Jones and, uh, and Rossetti. This is another illustration, and uh, one thing that I'm interested in as well is the connection uh, between uh, articles in the journal poems and the illustration. So in here, this is a poem, uh, this illustration by, whoops, sorry, no, no, <laughs> there, of uh, Jan Preisler, uh, is to accompany a poem by Jan Neruda. Uh, Jan Neruda was by then quite an elderly but very celebrated uh, artist, um, poem, poet, uh, very much kind of linked to promoting the national values in his poetry, so slightly um, interesting combination using Preisler, who was much more associated with foreign influences. And he wrote this poem, A Memory, which was not typical for him, because it was all about, you know, very kind of flamboyant descriptions of, of, of losing in love and brokenheartedness and solitude and the impossibility of overcoming those notions. And to illustrate that, um, Preisler um, looked at both Byrne Jones and Rossetti and selected certain motifs like the um, uh, the Briar Rose motif of the roses that you can see in here, but also did several studies uh, quoting various works of Rossetti uh, in the way the kind of head of the lady uh, is tilted. And all that connected to Jan Neruda's poem, which reflects another important dimension, uh, which I can see quite clearly in these magazines, which is also this dispute um, between whether Czech art should be celebrating the Czechness. There's very often these, um, th th these terms of the Czechness, what is the Czechness in our art, as opposed to opening the doors and windows, which is a quote from one of the magazines, opening the doors and windows uh, to, to Europe and to the uh, wider world. Here is the study, uh, uh, clearly uh, very strong, uh, strongly inspired by um, Rossetti's, uh, Rossetti's Beata Beatrix. Um, there is a whole bunch of studies by 
Reisler, where he positioned his model in a very, very similar, almost exact uh, same position. And this then later led to uh, the creation of this character, who is obviously painted in a very different style, but is still linked to uh, these studies. Uh, in a painting which was a major statement by, by uh, Preisler, uh, the painting called Spring, uh, which is now at the West Bohemian Gallery in, in Pilsen and has just been actually uh, published in uh, a publication about Czech art by uh, Scala Publishers, which is, uh, which is wonderful, uh, wonderful news. Um, I mentioned, uh, I think I'll skip one, there we go. Uh, so another really important magazine, apart from the Free Directions one, was uh, one called Rozhledy, The Outlooks. Uh, this is a magazine that was much more focused on uh, literature and poetry and featured a lot of um, translations uh, from, from English into Czech uh, by some really fascinating uh, characters. Uh, in this magazine, uh, we have this wonderful record uh, by an artist, muse, model and wife, and muse in very inverted commas, uh, Eliška Švabinská. Uh, this is a person that I talked about in the 2019 conference on Pre-Raphaelite Sisters, and she was the, the wife of uh, the artist Max Švabinský, who is another Czech artist really predominantly inspired by the Pre-Raphaelites for a brief but very intense period. And as I was showing then, Ella was actually instrumental in promoting uh, the Pre-Raphaelite passion in Shwabinsky's work. And she wrote in 1963, she wrote a book, a big book of memoirs. And in this book, she says, I quote, uh, the whole of our family was excited by an extraordinary artistic experience. The Prague artistic and literary circus were swept away by a wave of fascination with the English pre-Raphaelites. Schwabinski would bring us articles and books with reproductions of their paintings. Especially the magazine Rozhledy, Outlooks, featured a number of their poetry and reviews of their work. The reproductions of their paintings have totally blown me away. We would all look at them with utmost excitement. So here is a really wonderful document uh, showing how important the magazines were and also how important was the merge of the networks of the literary and the artistic, which always appear together in these, uh, in these magazines. Uh, as a case study of how this proliferated into the works of Czech artists, uh, here is another article in the same magazine, so in Rozhledy, in Outlooks, by this fantastic character called Jofia Bohorecka Shepkova, who was a literary critic and a, um, a writer, an author. She, at this time, at, at 1899, she just married a medical doctor and moved away from Prague and became one of the kind of spearheader of uh, feminist ideas outside of the, uh, the capital. Of the, Czech, uh, of the Czech lands. She is a fascinating character that really deserves some, some uh, separate research, and I'm really looking forward to doing that sometime uh, soon. So Bohorecka Shepkova published uh, an article dedicated specifically uh, to Dante Gabriel Rossetti, in which he says, I quote, the foundation of Rossetti's creative strength is a deep concept of his female characters and the relationship between men and women. His love affair with Siddle, and in here she's actually using a Czechified uh, term for Elizabeth Siddle, so she's calling her Alžběta Sidalová, which is a really interesting way of appropriating the identity of Elizabeth Siddle and transforming it into something that belongs to us Czechs, and she's not Elizabeth, she's Alžběta. So his love affair with Siddle and her death the abundant love of the poet, in Dante's words, love that moves the sun and other stars, all his suffering and pain were the soil out of which grew these magical and mystical flowers of poetry and all the troublesome as well as the beautiful that they emanate. Bohrodská Šepkova then concludes that Rossetti's specific literary and artistic style came, came about thanks to a specific mixture of international mentalities. She says, English and Italian, German spirituality and the southern heat of the senses. Decadence, symbolism, mysticism, neo-Christianity, and being a visionary at the same time. These movements for which literature has only now find suitable expressions are all preformed with Rossetti. And she was specifically fascinated by his artwork, The Blessed Amazel, and she wrote, uh, she translated uh, Rossetti's poem uh, as well into Czech.
Now, this was instrumental and very inspiring to a whole cohort of Czech artists. And in my last few slides, I want to focus on uh, Max Schwabinski, uh, who was uh, the husband of Ella, whose diaries we've been uh, hearing from, and who has a series of work that were really passionately inspired by the Pre-Raphaelites. So um, in uh, this uh, image called uh, Joy Joy from... Um, 1898, uh, Rossetti was very clearly inspired by uh, the section from uh, Paola and Francesca di Rimini, which we've, we've also seen today. So it's brilliant to kind of foster these connections. Now, this drawing was originally meant to be called The Dream of Young Age and was meant to be published in another art journal called Zlata Praha, the Golden Prague, which was more of a kind of a popular journal, not specifically fine art, focused. And the editor of that journal at the time was Jaroslav Vrchlitsky, who is a very uh, well-known poet at the time. Uh, Vrchlitsky was nominated for the Nobel Prize eight times, never got it, but was nominated. Um, was, <laughs> unfortunately, typical Czech story. Uh, and, <laughs> but and another typical Czech story is that he was repeatedly criticized by his peers for taking foreign inspirations instead of uh, uh, instead of glorifying and, and celebrating this elusive Czechness that um, articles around 1900s were all calling for and, and critics were desiring. Uh, and obviously, Vrchlitsky would then be fascinated by Schwabinsky's connections to, uh, to the Pre-Raphaelites and to Rossetti, and that's why he would uh, stimulate him to produce uh, this artwork for the, for the magazine. Vrchlitsky was also one of these fantastic characters that play, played several roles at the same time, because he translated prose and poetry from a whole range of languages, including English, French, Italian, Italian, Spanish, and several others. On top of that, he obviously spoke Czech and also German, so quite admirable reading. Vrechlitsky, on top of that, also wrote two poems specifically about Rossetti's works. In 1896, he dedicated uh, two poems to um, Rossetti's paintings La Bella Mano and the Astratus Sirica, and a poem entitled Dante Gabriel, Gabriel Rossetti in 1891, which was mostly dedicated to the death of Elizabeth Siddle and the, the outpouring of emotions that this, um, uh, this brought out in, uh, in Rossetti. Uh, another work that was uh, really um, strongly influential for, uh, for Shrebinsky was uh, the combination, again, between Rossetti's and, 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 and Burne Jones. So for one reason or another, Rossetti and Burne Jones for the Czech audiences became synonymous. And when you read through articles uh, about Pre-Raphaelites, uh, these are the two names that will be jumping at you repeatedly. And it's very difficult to find other names appearing. Uh, so I'm really interested in why this was the case and, and why there aren't many any uh, other names coming up, while I think you can actually see reference, references to other artists um, as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, several works by Schwabinski uh, called uh, collectively The Confluence of Souls, uh, this is a series of about five works. Uh, the, um, this is uh, An Oil, which is probably the most famous one uh, of these works today. However, the final version, which, which Schwabinski actually considered to be uh, the climax of his efforts, uh, was this one. This is a detail from the composition, and that is in ink on paper. So he actually had this deeply seated love for uh, works on paper, for ink uh, drawing, and for watercolors as well, which he personally preferred uh, over oils. And uh, in a in connection to this painting, uh, Bohoretska Shepkova again uh, writes in her article on Rossetti in 1899. She says, the young milliner Elizabeth Sidalova, Elizabeth Siddle, uh, became the representative type of his art. She was his angel and his demon, a muse who inspired him to create the most beautiful works, and a vampire who sucked away the blood of his veins. So... <laughs> This was a story that really shook the Czech audiences. They were absolutely in love uh, with the uh, the kind of heartbreaking story of of um, uh, Rossetti and and Siddle, and they couldn't get enough of this kind of demonic uh, character of of Siddle. And that's something that also mirrors in uh, Schwabinski's uh, Schwabinski's work. For decades, Czech art historians are coming up with various stories of whether this is uh, a loving embrace or whether the woman is actually a demon, because he's not looking extremely happy if you look very closely and uh, very interestingly Ella herself in her in her 
And Memoirs looks back at the painting and suggests that this was meant to be the embodiment of love and, and uh, that, that, that the, the kind of look in his face uh, is his realization that by committing to this woman, he's kind of responsible for, for her for the rest of his life. Now, these memoir, memoirs were uh, written in 1963 and actually edited by Shrebinsky himself, although by this point he would have been divorced uh, from, uh, from uh, Ella for about 20 years. So um, better take everything in there with a pinch of salt. Uh, I mentioned that uh, it's really important to see uh, the British influences in an international context. I was focusing so far on texts written in Czech, but there was a lot of texts in foreign languages that Czech artists would be working with. Uh, one of these would be a series of uh, books on the history of 19th century art um, by Richard Mutter. And here I have to really thank to Eduardo, who uh, a few years ago when we were consulting over a conceptual bottle of wine, suggested that I check uh, Mutter work and uh, this has been transformative for me so uh, having wine with colleagues is a very important art historical uh, method. Uh, the other image that I'm showing here is from uh, another uh, very large study on Dante Gabriel Rossetti uh, by um, Yuri Karasek Zelvovitz who is another fascinating character and kind of in between or between artists and uh, and literary, literary scholars and poets so uh, he was a poet and an author and a translator as well and was mainly associated with another journal called the Modern Review, Moderni Revi. Uh, this was a cutting-edge journal, very short-lived, but very passionate and, and, and very, very edgy. And in there alone, several articles specifically about the death of Siddle and even more specifically about the unearthing of, 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 of Rossetti's poems from her coffin uh, were written in, in quite a kind of flamboyant style. So that was a very popular story. Now, Yuri Karas Zelvovitz wrote uh, an extensive essay on, on Rossetti, both on his literary works, poems and, uh, and art. Um, uh, this was published only in 1906, but these were written pre-1900s in his collector, collection of essays, Art as Criticism of Life, Literary Studies. Now, Karasek himself in 1895, when Oscar Wilde was trialed, Karasek was the first ever Czech person to openly support homosexual relationships and instigated a popular debate uh, um, on the necessity of a sexual reform. So this is an interesting connection as well, a very important, uh, very important player. Few very quick comparisons because we don't have the time to go uh, to go into them. This is Shrebinsky styling Ella in the way that he thought uh, Rossetti was using his models. So you can see some lovely details in, in here of the wines mirrored in the in the uh, uh, wallpaper. Also, we had an interesting chat about birds during this conference. Well, this was actually, this bird was purchased specifically for this painting and then became uh, became the start of uh, Schwabinski's own menagerie. So again, he was somehow mirroring uh, the Rosettes in their menagerie and he ended up with a large collection of exotic birds, which I'm sure was completely illegal even then, uh, but he uh, definitely went for it. Uh, another big work by him, The Poor Region, has several inspirations. In the next few slides, I want you to see that kind of international dimension and that it's not easy to pinpoint where exactly inspirations come from. And when it comes to the posture of the main character, who again is Ella, uh, you can see a very clear similarity to uh, Burne Jones. However, there's also a, a bit of melee, that kind of position on that uh, uh, on the edge of a path overlooking a landscape and, and the kind of spreading of the of the arms. Uh, but there's also uh, non-British influences. So, for example, Jules Bastien Lepage was incredibly popular. There were a lot of articles, again, in all of the journals that I mentioned today. Uh, although they didn't bring this specific reproduction, there were, there were articles on his work. And a few years ago, there was a wonderful conference in Budapest on naturalism and the role of Lepage specifically for the Eastern European region. And his role was absolutely massive. But there were also articles like in Versacrum where um, there was a, a photographic competition and this uh, is one of the images that was awarded an award in this photographic competition uh, in 1898, uh, so something that uh, Shrebinsky too could have seen. And I always show this slide because this shows that uh, the poor region was even featured on Google. So we have made it, Shekhar has made it <laughs> to, to Google. And again, Shvabinsky using Ella in a kind of traditional uh, central bohemian setting, but he's literally quoting a figure uh, from the Briar Rose, which was very inspiring. And this is the end. This is the end of my talk. <laughs> I've gone over. Thank you so much. There's a lot to explore. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Helena, for your amazing analysis. And of course, thank you for our conversation about illustrated books of the fin de siècle. And now uh, let's travel around the world again, but and from the Czech lands to the American continent. And we, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Sophie Linford from the Delaware Art Museum, uh, where she is the curator of the Bancroft Collection of Preafalai Art. And she is going to present a paper titled The Rossettis in America. Please welcome Sophie Linford. Even with this uh, little stool. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. It's been so lovely to spend time with you all these past two days. Before I start, I want to take a minute to thank Carol Jacoby and James Finch, the co-curators of this exhibition, who have been the most generous and delightful colleagues to partner with in adapting the show for the Delaware Art Museum. So thank you both so much. And many thanks to the fabulous teams at York and the PMC who made this conference possible. It's really so wonderful to have a reason to gather. So without further ado, we are in February 1860. The American artist and journalist, ooh, Cut out was out of the bag right away. Um, William James Stillman was in London. After visiting the studio of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Stillman penned a letter home to his friend Charles Eliot Norton, who was also oh, no. <laughs> I see now that this is very sensitive. Um, <laughs> penned a letter home to his friend Charles Eliot Norton, who was also close with the Rossettis. Norton was co-editor of the North American Review, the United States' first literary magazine. He was also a confidant to Ruskin. Years later, in 1874, Norton would join Harvard's faculty, becoming the United States' first professor of art history. But that winter of 1860, leaving Rossetti's studio, Stillman wrote Norton with bad news. I am afraid your drawing, which is a lady giving banners to some knights, will scarcely be more popular than your Clark Saunders was. I do not know what to think, but I am almost determined that it is an affectation and that Rossetti must do something else or resign all future claim to greatness. Power he has and enough, but power is only half. He's wrong some way. Oh, he's wrong some way. The work in question was Rossetti's Before the Battle, now in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. In 1857, when Norton was himself in London, he had commissioned a watercolor from Rossetti. The artist finished the work a year later, deeming it, quote, in color, one of the best things I've ever done. But instead of turning it over to Norton, Ruskin asked if he could, or excuse me, Rossetti asked if he could keep it a little to show. Much to Norton's surprise, and it appears disappointment, it would be four years before he received the watercolor. In the intervening period, critical events transpired. The first exhibition of British art went on view in America in 1857, touring New York, Philadelphia, Boston, introducing Americans to pre-Raphaelitism. From that show, Norton purchased Elizabeth Siddle's Clark Saunders. Meanwhile, sectional tensions heightened across the United States, with civil war erupting in 1861. Throughout this period, a rich correspondence among five individuals proliferated. Between mid-1857 and late-1862, a month rarely passed without a letter crossing the Atlantic between Rossetti, his brother William Michael, and Ruskin in London, 
and Stillman and Norton in New York and Boston. The most frequent topic of conversation was before the battle. Opinions differed on whether it was <laughs> Opinions differed on whether it was exquisite, whether it was, in Stillman's words, inexcusably careless and entirely affected, whether it was truly finished, and whether Norton would ever receive it. In my paper today, using as my primary sources this robust transatlantic correspondence, much of it unpublished, I will argue that Norton's interpretation of before the battle subject matter, the timing he received the piece, and the way he ultimately deployed the picture once it was in his hands were all entangled with the American Civil War, and specifically with the ongoing <laughs> an international debate over emancipation. Norton is a pivotal character in the history of art and political reform in the 19th century United States. I first became interested in him through my work on the American Pre-Raphaelites, who relied upon Norton as an intellectual mentor and as their leading patron. A scholar of Dante in the Italian Middle Ages, Norton found his relationship with the Rossettis and Ruskin flourished naturally. Norton connected with the American Pre-Raphaelites at their initial formation in 1863, and in the eight years prior, he dedicated much of his energy to promoting, to a largely disinterested American audience, the art, writing, and principles of the British Pre-Raphaelites and the benefits of Gothic revival architecture. Norton first embraced the merits of Pre-Raphaelitism and Gothic revivalism during a European trip between 1855 and 1857, in which he followed an itinerary set by Ruskin. In London, in the summer of 1857, Norton attended the Pre-Raphaelite exhibition at 4 Russell Place and was taken with Siddle's Clark Saunders and a selection of work by Rossetti. <coughs> by this time, Norton knew that Clark Saunders would be coming to America that fall for the exhibition of English art, which William Michael Rossetti was actively helping to organize. Norton also learned during that summer that Dante Gabriel was patently refusing to send any work across the Atlantic for the show. Norton determined that a commission was the only way he would obtain America's first Rossetti. When Before the Battle was finished a year later, Rossetti was eager to know whether the subject would please Norton's fancy. He described it as, quote, a castle full of ladies who have been embroidering banners which are now being fastened to the spears by the lady of the castle. <coughs> These chivalric Flossartian themes are quite a passion of mine, Rossetti explained, but whether of yours also, I do not know. Rossetti needn't have worried. While the artist was at work on Before the Battle, Norton was writing Notes of Travel and Study in Italy, in which he explored the ongoing relevance of medieval culture. Norton followed Ruskin in identifying the republicanism of the late Middle Ages as having been a prerequisite for the production of powerfully evocative art. Gothic architecture, Norton believed, exemplified values of egalitarianism. In contrast to Victorian mechanized production that alienated and subordinated the laborer, Gothic architecture was built by craftsmen whose guilds guaranteed devoted workmanship, granted workers autonomy, and conferred status and respect. The cultural historian Linda Dowling has observed that for Norton, quote, invoking history, especially medieval history, thus became neither an aristocratic flourish nor a nostalgic appeal, but a fervent gesture of sympathy and solidarity with humanity. In Before the Battle, Ro Rossetti has, as we saw in St. Catherine, in Deborah's wonderful paper this morning, pictured a scene of communal labor and solidarity. Each figure is occupied with individual tasks that benefit the collective mission. 
The central figure stands on a dais, tying pennants to a halberd spear presented by a knight. She has sheathed, so to speak, her own tools in her pocket. The scene behind her is one of industriousness. Women work looms or comb flax. These fibers will be dyed and woven into pennants, such as those on display. Decidedly male labor is relegated to the back corner of the composition, where knights spar, rehearsing the battle to come. When, Rossetti, when Norton received Rossetti's inquiry, did this subject please his fancy, the American responded swiftly, affirming his interest in the piece and forwarding the requested payment of 50 guineas. But Norton neither acquired the watercolor nor heard from Rossetti again for three and a half years. During that period, however, Norton was frequently in touch with William Michael, with Stillman, and with Ruskin. As the 1860s approached, communication between the men often touched on the sectional hostilities inflaming America. Most of the letters also included some mention of before the battle, the work that everyone knew rightly belonged to Norton, but that Rossetti could not let go. In 1860, Norton deputized both Stillman and Ruskin to retrieve his watercolor. Stillman seems to have gone as far as to arrange to send before the battle to Norton with a group of his own works. That didn't come to pass. Ruskin felt some personal responsibility for Rossetti's sluggish delivery, as the critic had disparaged the watercolor shortly after the artist had completed it. And this is a letter uh, in the same year as the one that Deborah uh, read from us earlier. So when in early 1862, Rossetti was finally ready to send the work to Norton, he explained the delay. There is only one shadow of reason which I can give for this, namely that I found it did not prove a favorite among my drawings with our mutual friend Ruskin. The critic had been characteristically blunter about the work in a letter to Norton, quote, I think it almost the worst thing he has ever done. It will not only bitterly disappoint you, but put an end to all chance of Rossetti's reputation ever beginning in America. Among the group of five correspondents, there was a lot riding on before the battle. It was meant to be Rossetti's American debut. Norton was eager to bring the first Rossetti into the country, following lamentations over the artist's absence in the 1857-1858 exhibition. American audiences had been keenly aware that Rossetti's, quote, works of transcendent interest, as one journalist described them, were noticeably missing from the show. Norton knew that before the battle would be the ideal work to visualize his own theories on the moral crusade of the Civil War. As editor of the New England Loyal Publications Society, Norton wrote broadsides to increase public support for the Union effort. These were syndicated in newspapers throughout small towns in the northern states and, importantly, in European countries. Stillman and William Michael shared their American friends' abolitionist commitments. The two actively followed Norton's antebellum and wartime output. Ruskin, by contrast, supported the Confederacy, which led to a breakdown in his relationship with Norton during the war years. Norton believed that through their selection of medieval subjects, pre-Raphaelite artists recovered values that could address the social challenges of the present day. There is some indication that Rossetti, too, was alert to the reason behind Norton's interest in his work, and specifically in Before the Battle. During the first days of 1862, Rossetti wrote Norton to report he was ready at long last to deliver the watercolor. The letter is lengthy, nearly 2,500 words, and covers several topics, including Rossetti's marriage to Elizabeth Siddle, his sister's forthcoming Goblin Market, and his own publication of his early Italian poets. 
Rossetti also dedicated space to congratulating Norton on his own publications, most notably Notes of Travel and Study in Italy. I dare say, declared Rossetti to Norton, you are doing something worth reading. Some paragraphs later, there's a shift in subject that would seem abrupt to anyone unfamiliar with Norton's writings. About 18 months into the Civil War, Rossetti intuited, quote, surely it must be painful to an American to see what is to be seen with you now. This, however, is a matter so out of the current of my ideas that I am quite incompetent to speak of it. God send we may not have war with your country. It would be the end of all things. Rossetti's comments were made in the wake of the Trent Affair, a diplomatic crisis between the United States and Great Britain in late 1861, when it appeared that Britain, then officially neutral, might side with the Confederacy in the Civil War and cause conflict between the two nations. Though this was ultimately avoided, Rossetti's reference to transatlantic tensions in a letter otherwise devoted to art, culture, and the watercolor he deemed ultra-medieval suggest that the artist was attentive to how his American friend yoked these topics in his own writing. Upon the arrival of Before the Battle in Massachusetts, Norton turned to a new research topic. He began adapting, no, he began adapting ideas on medieval craftsmanship and the politics of the Middle Ages to confront American exigencies. His work in Notes of Travel and Study in Italy, specifically of the art and civic life of Orvieto, Florence, and Siena, stimulated him to map the trajectory of American civilization against the accomplishments of those Italian city-states. Norton publicly debuted his new project in a lecture, Emancipation in the Middle Ages, on January 1st, 1863, the day the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. The proclamation was a turning point in the Civil War and announced, quote, that all persons held as slaves are and henceforth shall be free. In Emancipation in the Middle Ages, Norton advanced the notion that the Civil War was a crisis, quote, for which the whole past seemed to have been a preparation. Detailing selective narratives of brutal oppression and valiant uprising from the birth of the Roman Empire through the Middle Ages Norton linked the manumission of the serfs, who were freed by their lords after fighting in the Crusades, to a viable pathway for the emancipation of enslaved American laborers, enlistment in the Union Army. Norton's timing of this message was purposeful. His lecture was delivered on the day black soldiers were legally permitted to enlist in the Union Army. The question over whether free men of color and enslaved workers could serve in the military had been bitterly debated among union leaders since the war's earliest days. In Norton's view, the Emancipation Proclamation settled that dispute, opening, in his words, quote, a new era for the progress of mankind. Norton hoped that his country's new legislation would stimulate the same, quote, revolutionary spirit unleashed when the Crusades broke down barriers between high and low, so visualized in Before the Battle, where an aristocratic lady joins the efforts of the laboring and visibly lower class women. It was during the Middle Ages, Norton argued, in such moments of, quote, munificence and spirit that the peasant was emancipated from the worst servitude, end quote. Unbeknownst to Norton, Just days after he delivered Emancipation in the Middle Ages, a group of young artists, spurred by the writings of Norton Ruskin and the art of the Pre-Raphaelites, gathered in New York to found the Association for the Advancement of Truth in Art. They would, in short order, become known as the American Pre-Raphaelites. Within months, they connected with Norton, who became a crucial source of counsel, financial assistance, and patronage. The emergence of a pre-Raphaelite movement in Norton's own country fulfilled an aspiration born years earlier when he commissioned before the battle. Norton enthusiastically reported the news to Rossetti, writing that the watercolor, quote, brings youth to my thoughts so often in the midst of our great war. 
but there is hope for art in this country. The true ideas, the ideas the PRB has done so much to make clear, are extending among our younger men, both painters and architects, and we shall before long have some good work to show. But Norton did not want to leave that production of good work to chance. To encourage his compatriots' efforts, Norton invited the American Pre-Raphaelites to his home in Cambridge to examine his growing collection. He lent before the battle to one of the group's painters, Charles Herbert Moore, who wrote that he, quote, spent a great part of winter in copying it as a means of thoroughly studying it. To conclude, I'd like to share a few thoughts on interartistic and transregional exchange I reflected on while writing this talk. I've spent years examining macro forces that produce transatlantic art movements, international expositions, religious practices, war. But in working on this talk, it struck me that so much of the actual labor of translating across the Atlantic the Pre-Raphaelites, vibrant palette, angular linearity, and flattened surfaces took place on a much more modest and personal level. In the private correspondence between the Rossettis, Stillman, Ruskin, and Norton, the radicalism of the Pre-Raphaelite project was investigated and ultimately, in Norton's hands, adopted for American audiences. Armed with the Rossetti he commissioned, Norton hoped he could offer his fellow Americans what he believed would be, quote, deliverance to those who have long lived in darkness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Absolutely amazing. And now let's get back to... Europe, let's back to the European continent, and from the Americas to Ireland with Saif Kellett, um, who is a um, PhD candidate at the University of uh, St. Andrews, researching on the relationship between Gaelic mythology and national identity in modern Irish and Scottish literature. And today she's presenting a paper titled Better Than the Lancelot of Arthurian Legend, Catherine Tynan, Gaelic mythology and the Pre-Raphaelites. Please welcome Saif Kellett. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you so much for the um, fantastic and deeply interesting talks that we've had today and yesterday. So I'm approaching the Rosettis from a slightly different angle um, uh, in relation to Celtic and Irish studies and as part of, part of my ongoing thesis I'm looking at how the Irish writer Catherine Tynan applied Rossetti in medievalist aesthetics in her modern adaptation of the Irish myth Torheacht Yermida August Grania in her 1887 poem The Pursuit of Diarmid and Grania. I particularly focus on how Rossettian themes are used to make room for both her Catholic faith and Irish nationalist feminism within her retelling though today I will briefly focus on the latter. For some context, during the Irish revolutionary period, which spanned from the late 19th to early 20th century, Gaelic mythology was hugely important to the national conversation around Irish identity because it gave the Irish the ability to imagine a pre-colonial Gaelic Ireland and therefore a framework for a post-colonial Gaelic Ireland. Artists and writers thus began to adapt the mythology, translating it into modern Irish or the English language as well as adapting it to modern mores and tastes. In this talk, I will be focusing on the radical potential of the Rossettis in this context, but nevertheless, I also want to note the extant limits of using a decidedly English art in articulating a form of Gaelic mythology as well, something I will be happy to discuss in our following panel. So, let's try this sensitive remote. Off to a good start. Tynan was a middle-class writer from a farming family in rural County Dublin. She was a well-educated woman who remarkably managed to remain financially independent on the back of a, quite frankly, awe-inspiring writing career, even when she was married. She was a powerhouse of a writer, writing over 100 novels, 
five autobiographies, six poetry collections, as well as newspaper articles, devotionals, songbooks, so on, so on. Amazing what you can achieve without Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> Tynan was very much a new woman. And this is reflected in her work during 1887. In her poem, The Pursuit of Dermid and Grania in particular, her portrayal of the heroine Grania and her relationship with the hero Dermid advanced female social and sexual autonomy. In the poem, Tynan follows Standish O'Grady's 1880 English translation of the myth, and it is therefore notable that the changes she makes to this translation in her portrayal of the couple's relationship are very much towards anticipating the contemporary feminist Sarah Grant's call to arms in her essay, The New Aspect of the Woman Question from 1894. And this essay would put forth the idea of the new woman and indeed laments the state of contemporary masculinity, utilising a popular medievalist language to ask, but where are our men? Where is the chivalry and the noble self-sacrifice? Tynan's choice to use both Toriok, Diarmida August Grania and Rossettian aesthetics are reflective of the strain of medievalist imagery and language used during the 19th century to explore progressive, in this case, feminist ideas. Claire Broom Saunders writes that post-conquest England could be perceived as a time where women enjoyed a climate of greater rights and freedom than their 19th century present. And thus, unsurprisingly, she suggests that extending from this came a form of female chivalry, a crusade for the right to equal involvement in public as well as private life. Saunders' perceptions are as applicable to Tynan in her response to looking back towards a mythical medieval Gaelic Ireland as well. Toriacht Yermida August Grania appears in manuscripts from about the 16th century onwards, but there is also an earlier 10th century version. It is also embedded into the Irish landscape with famous landmarks and notable cairns and stones, for example, Dermid and Grania's cave in Sligo. Um, it's particularly popular in Irish folklore as well. It essentially tells of how the Princess of Ireland, Grania, refuses her arranged marriage to an aged Fionn McCool, who is one of Ireland's greatest mythical heroes. And she elopes instead with one of his more age-appropriate and dashingly handsome uh, warriors, Dermid. The couple are subsequently chased across Ireland by a humiliated Fionn and his warriors until Dermid's foster father, Angus of the Two Hedae, um, here best described using Mark Williams' term, uh, they are medieval after images of the Irish gods, brokers a truce between the warring parties and Fionn eventually relents. Dermid and Grania live out their lives together on the west coast of Ireland until one day, in an attempt to heal the bonds between Dermid and his fellow warriors, he goes hunting boar with Fionn on Ben Bulbin in Sligo. Dermid is subsequently skewered by a boar, and instead of using his healing powers to save Dermid, Fionn hesitates, only agreeing to help when it is already too late and Dermid has died. So, in order to re-articulate Dermid and Grania's story, one of the most famous and beloved in Irish culture, in the context of her feminist ideals, Tynan turned to what might perhaps seem a rather surprising source of help, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. For Tynan, the Rossetti family were central to the aesthetics of her early career. Peter van de Kamp remarks that Tynan hero worshipped the Rossettis. Many reviewers of her first poetry collection, Louise de la Valliere, noted Rossetti's influence. Indeed, Tynan met the Rossettis on several occasions from 1885 onwards. She originally reached out to William, sending him her first collection of poems, which he greatly admired and shared with Christina, sending Tynan back autographed photos of Gabriel. And you see Tynan, in reflecting on her meetings with the Rossettis, um, proclaims that her adoration for Dante Rossetti had pleased and touched them. I exuded it. In those days, my grief was that I could not have won one word of his approval. Her second collection, Shamrocks, in which The Pursuit of Dermot and Grania is published, is moreover dedicated to William and Christina Rossetti, making the Rossettis an explicit frame of this text. However, it is Dante Gabriel's influence that I argue is most felt in her engagement with the Gaelic mythology. Straight away, Rossetti's influence is apparent in the physical depiction of Grania. You can see on this slide one very immediate obvious, uh, obvious reference in the second line, um, through the blue windows of my maiden bower, and a reference to the blue bower perhaps. 
Indeed, further connections can evidently be drawn regarding the wider courtly world in which Dermot and Grania exist. This is very much a medievalist world in which Tynan utilizes the language of Rossetti in poems like The Blessed Damozel or works such as The Blue Bower, a Victorian medievalism more so than a historically accurate attempt at capturing what is very, very different uh, early medievalist Irish or medieval Irish politics. These blatant references suggest that Tynan is very much drawing <laughs> on Rossetti's medievalism to create a mythical Ireland. Regarding Grania herself, Tynan paints her as one of Rossetti's stunners, or specifically what Susan P. Casteris calls his dark Venuses. Speaking of Rossetti's style from the 1860s onwards, Casteris recalls how, in contrast to general Victorian preferences for flaxen maidens of irreproachable virtue, Rossetti painted dark Venuses with direct gazes whose full lips connoted carnality and availability. We can see these Rossettian images and indeed language evocative of his damozel at play in Tynan's vision of Grania, in the focus on the dusky hair that frames her face like night doth frame a star, in her long troth like a lily, and her deep eyes, in the proud manner in which she holds herself, Grania is described as having stag-like grace. As with Rossetti's women, Grania disrupts the major minor Victorian beauty standards. She is tall and notably displays what would have been considered more traditionally masculine qualities such as pride and stature. Tynan is taking Rossetti's imagery of women, which are evidently a product of the male gaze, and using it instead to distinguish a different vision of womanhood for her mythical Irish princess, one that is far from demure, shows independence of spirit and a great deal of sexual and social agency and confidence. Indeed, upon Grania's confession of her desire for Diarmid in the poem, Tynan's arrangement of Grania's hair calls to mind Jan Marsh's amazing comment on the artist ensnared by hair, an image that crops up in Rossetti's The Blessed Damozel, which at this point I think is safe to say is an obvious influence on Tynan's depiction of Grania. Rossetti's remark, she leaned over me, her hair fell all about my face, is echoed in Tynan's poem when Grania asks Diarmid to buy thy nightly fame, take me. Grania's hair is on the ground and o'er his hands and feet. Openly confessing her desire for Diarmid, she has already physically bound them together. By reconstructing Grania within the imagery of Rossetti's dark Venus, Tynan adopts and incorporates as well that which they signify, availability, desire, power and erotic tension, all of which contribute to the explicit sense of agency here. Like an Arthurian enchantress in one of the uh, pre-Raphaelite paintings, Gwania puts all of her wedding guests to sleep with a sleeping draft, including her husband Fionn, before asking Dermot to elope with her. Gwania enacts autonomy over her own life, taking control of her own fate and choosing her own well-being over the public overtly political marriage to Fionn, a marriage entirely designed for the benefit of her father rather than for herself. And Tynan is using Rossettian aesthetics to articulate this. Turning to our hero then. Perhaps the most striking characteristic of one adulterer beloved by the pre-Raphaelites, the Arthurian hero of Lancelot, has always been how his heroism arises out of his devotion to the Queen Guinevere, an equally defining trait of Tristan. Matilda Tamar and Bruckner notes, for example, how in Cratian's 12th century French romance, Lancelot ou le Chevalier de la Charette, Lancelot's love for the Queen generates an excess that benefits the entire Arthurian society. Love and prowess are not simply coordinated in terms of individual motivation for combat. Love is shown to be the force that leads Lancelot to achieve his greatest triumphs. Lancelot's love and his heroism are totally integrated. The pre-Raphaelites would also emphasise an Arthurian integration of love and heroism, something which Carl Silver links into the 1817 publication of the Mallory Caxton Le Mort d'Arthur. Rossetti is certainly interested in the power of the non-traditional and illicit lady-knight relationship, and indeed moments of criticality for that heroism. This is apparent in his visual works relating to Arthurian and chivalric literature, Tristan and Isolde are drinking the love potion, Arthur's tomb, the chapel before the lists, for example. Tynan is equally interested in this integration of love and heroism, which in her poem is a publicly beneficial form of heroism, unlike Fionn's self-serving obsession with retaining his reputation and legacy. Having put everyone to sleep, 
Gráinne asks Diarmid, who is the truest lover of women on earth, to take her away from the King's Hall and her damnation as an unwilling bride. In O'Grady's translation, Diarmid at this point refuses, to which Gráinne actually forces Diarmid evilly to go with her against his will by putting him under a gash or magical oath. Tynan changes this so that Diarmid is bound explicitly to help a woman in need, in this instance, a gorgeous princess who admits to having desired him for a very long time. And so even though it is his duty to help Gronia escape her unwanted marriage, the entire scene is so erotically charged and their mutual desire so plain. Indeed, his eyes gone flame and flamed and lightened all his dusky face that any questions of duty fall quickly to the wayside. Tynan's willingness to focus on Dermot's success in eloping with Grania, contrasting him with Tufion, who is here gnarled like an oak and as men deemed too old for men's uh, for love's delight, suggests that Tynan applies Rossetti's medievalist aesthetics to articulate their relationship as a feminist e example of a, what the potential could be for Irish relationships, and certainly going forward. This sense of pushing and building on Rossetti's and more widely widely PRB aesthetics is reflected in a letter to Count Plunk Plunkett in which Tynan remarks that Dermot seems to me very fine, better than the Lancelot of the Arthurian legend. I would argue that for Tynan, Dermot is better than the Lancelot because he frees Grania from her entrapment in marriage when she asks for his help. He does what Lancelot never does, even when Arthur is threatening to burn Guinevere at the stake. Diarmid physically removes Grania from an unhappy marital situation she otherwise might have trouble escaping owing to her specific societal position, whatever the cost. <clears throat> Speaking of the PRB, Silver suggests that as they reinterpreted figures they derived from the Mort Arthur, they made constancy and passion in chivalric love replace marital fidelity as a test of virtue. Now, I'm not suggesting here that Tynan was advocating for adultery, but certainly she is calling for a renegotiation of contemporary marriage values and indeed a far more equal version of it. Utilising Rossetti's language and imagery surrounding his women and Arthurian heroes, she finds a way of forging her progressive ideas within an Irish myth. Indeed, in the exhibition hall, the plaque for the kissed mouth suggests that Christina and Elizabeth wrote poems in the voices of young women coerced into marriage or seduced and left as outcasts. Here, using Dante's aesthetics, Tynan is able to reshape the mythical narrative to celebrate an escape from this oppressive norm. This reaches fruition in the fact that Diarmid's love heroism succeeds in empowering Grania and himself to the point that they quickly establish and oversee a medieval utopia, as you can see on this slide. Indeed, Tynan's articulation of the couple's periods of happiness and marriage that lasts 16 years justifies and celebrates the power of their consensual relationship, a love that is evidently a private and public success and which justifies Grani's expression of autonomy and choosing of her own man. To quote Tynan, for trust gave love his perfect part. Even at Diarmid's death, his form of Lancelotian masculinity and indeed his relationship with Grania is ultimately validated. Learning that Diarmid has died, Angus appears and takes Diarmid's body in a manner made critically evocative of King Arthur's death as found in Mallory. The fact that it is Diarmid, the Lancelot of Tynan's myth, who can be compared to Arthur instead of the traditional figurehead that is Fionn, only further suggests the superiority of this type of masculinity and relationship in an Irish context. I should also point out as well that following his death, Grania continues to display a level of agency when she keens for Diarmid, recounting his deeds and taking control of his narrative, ensuring his continued fame at the expense of Fionn. Rossetti and indeed the wider pre-Raphaelite brotherhood thus provide Tynan with a way into exploring this morally complex relationship, allowing her to actually forward their relationship in opposition to the traditional one between Fionn and Grania. The princess chooses her lover, and despite the trials and inevitable tragedy, felt all the more poignantly for the joy we as readers get to see extending from the relationship, the success of Diarmid and Grania both privately and eventually publicly suggests a potential for an Irish comprehension of marriage that affords value to both partners as active and willing participants in their relationship. By shaping the myth in this way during a point of supposed mythical revival, the potential for Tynan's version of the story to shape people's perceptions of the myth and therefore Gaelic-Irish values are poignant. 
Tynan's presentation of Irish gender roles and the explicit commentary on relationships in her version of Tori Oct Yermida Agus Grania chime with what is such an important point in time for women's rights regarding their own agency within their relationships, especially when you consider law changes such as the Married Women's Property Act of 1882 being passed by Parliament, as well as in a specifically Irish context, nationalist feminists turning to the heroines located in the mythology as examples of female agency, independence and occupation of political and military roles. This is most famously seen in the revolutionary Countess Markovitch's idolisation of Queen Maeve, the leader of the Irish army in the epic Town Bo Coolinga. By portraying Dermot and Grania's chosen relationship as consensual, erotic and personally and publicly beneficial, in contrast to any potential arranged marriage with Fionn, Tynan using Rossetti in aesthetics suggests then that the vision of the new Irish woman and man belonged to both past Gaelic values and certainly any future Gaelic Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much for your fantastic research papers. And I'm sure the room is bubbling with questions. So keep saving them for just a minute. And I was ex I'm extremely fascinated by the the methodology you have applied to your research papers. And on this, I would like to uh, hinge my, my question. So whether methodology might be you know, chosen, for instance, I don't know, uh, following social art history, gender <laughs> studies, um, queer culture, uh, post-colonial studies, and et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes the problem also related to methodology is also the terminology, the use of terminology. And I was really interested by the terminology you used in your papers. And I think actually in studies on international exchanges and international, yeah, inter internationalism, cultural internationalism, the, the use of correct terminology is really, really slippery, really, really hard. So considering also the the new developments in uh, art history and also um, cultural internationalism studies. Um, is it possible for you to, um, do you think it's possible to find um, an inclusive set of terms in order to analyze this phenomena in a more in inclusive way? Um, I, I suppose, um, I think there can be. And that's definitely something that I have tried to do today. And I did mention that there are, you know, we are working with an exhibition that deals with the, the radicalism mm -hmm. and, and radical potential yep. of the Rossettis. Um, but there is limits as well. And when you place the Rossettis or any form of art into another culture, um, another set of entirely different contexts, yes. um, the art takes a whole new life of its own. Um, and... On the one hand, I, I hope I've gotten across the radical potentials available um, to Irish uh, women writers um, yes. in the late 19th century. But there's also a limit in the sense that, um, coming at it from a post-colonial mm -hmm. perspective, the elision that comes with using an English art is inescapable as well. Yeah. So you have a situation where Tynan is both using the Rosettis to explore her more feminist um, ideals and the potential for um, her ability to look at Rosetti's paintings and see um, not necessarily um, the kind of more misogynistic elements, but potential in those women. Um, that at the same time being incorporated onto, on top of and to narrate an Irish myth is in itself causing an elision itself and a slippage because you first have an English language use. So immediately your Irish language is dropped. You have a medieval kind of Euro, uh, almost a Euro normative uh, mm -hmm. vision of what this fantasy, mythical, uh, medieval world can look like. And that is very different to the reality yeah. <laughs> of Irish uh, medieval uh, society and even the, the mythical one. So there definitely is these constant tensions and attempting to yeah. navigate through is always something you need to pay attention to. Okay. 
Thank you. Well, that was such a wonderful answer. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately got thinking about things. Um, for me, um, that's probably in the start of my paper. I included this little overview of things that I'm looking yeah, at. Exactly. And um, one uh, f- for me in 2021, this article by uh, Matthew Rempley created this wave of responses, which was really instrumental in shaping my understanding of these mm-hmm. questions. And um, these responses were published again in the Czech art history journal Umění Art, which is like the art history journal equivalent uh, in, in, in Czechia. And they are incredibly uh, kind of, they are incredibly plural responses. And one of the things that come clearly through is exactly that slippage of terminology. And that even within uh, the group of art historians looking at this geographical area, we almost don't agree on anything from <laughs> what is the name of this geographical area. You know, even in my paper, I've used uh, Bohemia and Czech lands yeah. as synonyms, although they are not actually 100% synonyms. Mm-hmm. There could be, you know, where does Moravia, for example, sit within that? You know, so the first thing is even like the geographical terminology. But then uh, there's there's more to it. There's um, this whole idea of like, derivativeness, aesthetic value, delay. You know, my paper was all based around the year 1900, and you might uh, think, well, why are we even talking 1900s when, you know, the Rosettis, that's like 50 years old story now, you know, or uh, not completely, but, you know, a few decades uh, past. So, um, and when I started working on this research, I myself couldn't shake off the feeling of, well, all these Czech works that I'm bringing into the discussion, they're all just, you know, mere reflections of what is happening in in the epicenter. So I myself was guilty of that. And that was, to a certain degree, the result of how I was... So I did my undergraduate studies in in Prague at the Charles University, and that was something that I was kind of brought up almost to believe that, um, you know, the, the better the metric is, the more you can get to mimic the center the better, you know, which is something that I don't really subscribe. And, you know, loads of other scholars don't don't as well. Yeah. And um, one of the responses in uh, the, the wonderful kind of plethora of, of responses to Matthew Rampley was Professor Milena Bartlova, uh, who said, um, I think we need to change the way we're looking at this and just get rid of this concept of delay mm-hmm. altogether and this idea that uh, the, the sooner you react something, the better, uh, the more the peripheries get to, you know close to the aesthetic mm-hmm. of the epicenter, uh, the better. All that should be really squared. Yeah. The, 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 the question of quality, which is something that really resonated with uh, the work of James O. Young, whose cultural appropriation um, mm-hmm. kind of methodological approach I was I was flirting with, shall we say? And you know, Young's um, theories are very much applied on. You know, he, he writes about uh, you know jazz and the appropriation of of you know African music mm-hmm. in jazz and and a lot of kind of contemporary art examples. So not necessarily he's not necessarily applying this to Victorian art, mm-hmm. um, but I could really see that it's really important. This he's got a theory of, of an aesthetic handicap. Cap and you know can can we can we um, achieve artistic aesthetic authenticity through work that is created by reflecting and borrowing from from other works you know like the work by Shvabinsky sure. where you know Ella mirrors several mm-hmm. other works by you know the pre-Raphaelites does it mean that it's just a really glorified copy or Excellent. can I claim that this is so yeah <laughs> Sophie. <laughs> I wonder if, in my response, I might ask a question to to the group um, because I think that something that come has come up for me in thinking about the Rossetti his entire career and thinking about how to present an exhibition on Dante Gabriel Rossetti on the Rossettis is whether the term pre Raphaelite applies to this whole show and I and in the text all of the interpretation that Carol and James uh, have on the wall, there's the narrative is that we're looking at Rossetti before, during, and beyond the pre-Raphaelite years. And yet this term, pre-Raphaelite, is what we use to sort of encompass all of Rossetti and all of the pre-Raphaelites. And it's something that I struggle with as the steward of a pre-Raphaelite 
collection in a museum, much of, much of the collection, you could say, is aestheticism or was produced largely after the core pre-Raphaelite years. And because of that, does that term pre-Raphaelite even really apply to the entire collection? And I found myself wondering, particularly Helena, during your paper, was the term pre you know, it sounds, it seems like there is quite a slippage with the term pre-Raphaelite and the artists that were being re- referenced in these Czech journals, but there was an elision between Rossetti, Burne Jones, um, and and do we even call Burne Jones a pre-Raphaelite? Um, and so, did the artists that were then emulating them in Prague in sorry the Czech lands? Um, <laughs> excuse me, well, this ca- capital for whole <laughs> area. Um, do they call, did they consider themselves pre-Raphaelites? Did they apply that term to themselves? They they did for a short period of time. I don't know whether I should answer that because that was well, yeah, and and, and you know, frankly, um, Helm and Hunt and Millet, and this is I'm I know I'm speaking to preaching to the choir now, but you all know that Millet and Holm and Hunt were very annoyed later in their career that the term pre-Raphaelite was being applied to the aesthetic works of Rossetti. And in fact, Millet wrote that this, isn't pre, this wasn't pre-Raphaelitism at all, it's Rossettiism. <laughs> and so that's what I actually, when I give tours of the collection at the Delaware Art Museum, and we're in the first gallery where we have such tremendous, Lady Lilith is the first work you see, I say, you know, this is Rossettiism that you're seeing. <laughs> it's not necessarily pre-Raphaelitism as it was formulated in 1848. I saw there was an enthusiastic hand. <laughs> okay, let's, let's open the floor to questions. Yeah? A gentleman? Um, oh. Oh, yes. Is it, <laughs> yep, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Hi. Please introduce yourself just before sure. the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my name is Ana Vadillo, and I'm from Burbeck, College, University of London. And thank you very much for this absolutely fantastic panel. <clears throat> and I have lots of questions to ask. But I guess uh, following up from, the, uh, from, your, from your starting point, uh, and while you were answering this question about methodologies, one thing that I kept on thinking about was the question of nationhood in the context of mm. the kind of this international uh, community of artists that were migrating and traveling and visiting all over Europe. And I felt there was kind of a tension between the national and the international that all your kind of papers spoke about, even talking about American independence. So I wonder whether there is something going on in that realm. And to kind of, to add a little bit more to, to kind of my, my thinking about it, to what point the use of, of the pre uh kind of, uh, if we call them pre um, they they are, uh, they are an attempt by other artists and writers, not just artists, but writers, to, to use them to modernize political narratives and whether that might be a way to kind of address uh, a kind of the situation of this group of artists and their ideas at a kind of, at a, in a more broader way that can be more inclusive. Yeah, that's a really excellent question and applies directly to the American context because they were purposefully using the label pre-Raphaelite, though I didn't show one American pre-Raphaelite work because it it felt outside the scope of the paper. But for anyone who is a, a little familiar, you'll know that it's not figurative at all. It's entirely landscape there. There is you know, not a tradition of history painting or religious painting in the United States. And so the adoption of the label pre-Raphaelite is a set of political ideas. They associate pre-Raphaelitism with a reformist and, like, politically rebellious um, position in art, and that is useful for them in their own sort of in this crucible of of the civil war in the in the United States and so yes in that way the term i think is explicitly linked to a set of ideas a, a set of sort of of iconographic and uh, you know visual formal elements as well but first and foremost a set of ideas 
Mm -hmm. I would, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for for the Bohemian artists as well, um, actually pre-Raphaelitism became associated with this larger struggle for be, for international connections for so i mentioned that there was this big conflict in a lot of the kind of art historical journals but also in in kind of the general press and art historical debates uh, at the turn of the century where there were two opposing tendencies and one was um you know artists in, in search for this elusive checkness this this specific quality uh, of bohemian art where nobody was quite sure what it was but everybody was meant to be searching for it and on the the other hand, an equally strong or maybe stronger tendency to uh, become more internationally connected and both uh, promote the uh, the exposure of, exposure of Czech artists abroad, but also bring more uh, international influences into uh, the country, including influences from beyond Europe. So there was, for example, a massive movement of you know promoting Japanese art in in the Czech lands as well. And furthermore, in in all of these journals that I'm uh, basing my research around, um, there, there's always such a flurry of articles that really criticize the situation of bohemian lands within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And without explicitly saying whether this, this was so or not, the general feeling of these articles is, look at Vienna, all the money always goes to Vienna, nothing ever comes to Prague, look at all these, you know, uh, Austrian artists, they get all the best shows, we always get the second class stuff in Prague, you know. And despite that, there were great investments uh, in, in, in culture in Prague actually and a whole you know at the turn of the century a whole new quarter was built which was called the Parisian quarter which had uh, you know um, uh, blocks of flats with with each flat had a spe site specific uh, sculptural and painterly decoration there were toilets there was running water there were elevators you know so it was living in Prague at the turn of the century could be quite pleasant despite that there was this belief that we're always getting something worse than uh, you know, more developed areas of the empire get. And in this, um, in this context, British art represented something that was not connected to the Austro-Hungarian Empire at all. And as such, despite the fact that obviously it was another big empire and that, it, you know, it had a low kind of problems of its own, including uh, obviously the whole kind of colonial concept, which wasn't really reflected at all in, in, in the Czech press, the, simply the association of the Pre-Raphaelites with Britain meant it's something that has nothing to do with the struggles that we're facing here in Central Europe, and hence we can look to them as somebody who represents uh, this uh, idea of uh, independence, strength, uh, you know, political sovereignty, which was something that the Czechs really desperately desired for themselves. So, yeah. Yeah, so I can give you a zoomed in answer and then a kind of zoomed out. And the zoomed in one would be, um, it's there is that kind of level of tension constantly existing. When Tynan um, publishes Shamrocks, um, she the the reviewers express a delight in the fact that she has moved beyond Rossetti. She is her own artist now, and she's not living in his shadow. Now that's not true. But the, re the thing that they were trying to celebrate instead was the fact that she had adopted a level of Celticness instead. And to kind of shift to that zoomed out answer, you see throughout um, art and literature, I think throughout the, the 19th and 20th century, a uh, kind of merging of this vision of Celticness and pre-Raphaelite aesthetics. Um, I can give you a very kind of Basic example being if we think of Tolkien's elves, which are heavily influenced by Welsh and Irish um, um, myth. Uh, the way we associate and think of them today visually are heavily influenced by uh, artists like Alan Lee. And they and he draws so heavily on pre-Raphaelite aesthetics. So you see this kind of melding together of both of them to talk about them in an international way that you know, you can immediately point to both and it becomes a kind of byword for each other. Um, but then thinking about it on a zoomed in level and what it means for Irish national identity to be using um, a non-Irish um, art movement then raises its own questions. Let's say nationalism and internationalism are two sides of the same exactly, coin. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, other question? Gentleman at the back? Yes? <laughs> yes? Uh, no? No? 
Yeah, oh, yes. Now, yes. <laughs> okay. I'm Andrew Stevenson. I have a question for the Czech paper. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's always fascinating when you're thinking about transcultural reception of British art because we focus on the main marketplaces, you know, France, Germany, later on in the States, of course. So to get a, a micro study of the Czech reception is great for two reasons. One's because it's, you know, a very small and kind of different market that you're dealing with. And secondly, as you rightly said, given that most of the art writers are using often German sources, which are then translated into uh, Czech. My concern was when you said that the conflation of Rossetti and Bern Germ. I really wonder, at 1900, Burne Jones is at the Paris International Exhibition. He, you know, he's, the tapestries are all there. It's getting a, re, a world, a global reception in that full sense. We know you referred to Muta, who sees at the end of his history of British art that he, Burne Jones, is one of the greatest artists ever, alongside Watts, but not Rossetti. And that he's written in these German in German magazines such as Die Kunst, and the reception in in Prague has highlighted his importance. I can't get how they just can conflate Rossetti and Burne Jones to the detriment of Burne Jones. Honestly, <laughs> I might say and it's brave man who says that at a Rossetti conference. <laughs> This is more like a comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'll just quickly respond yeah, to that. Sure. So thank you so much. That's, that's really uh, kind of great to hear. And it, it is fascinating. I don't really have the answer, you know, why this is so, except for I think these articles uh, about Ruskin really played an instrumental role in it. And very often both Rossetti and Burne Jones are mentioned in these articles. Also, Burne Jones uh, is much more, his works are reproduced more often than Rossetti's in his work. But there are many more articles that actually analyze Rossetti's work uh, than, than Burne Jones. So I, I haven't quite cracked the, uh, the, 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 the question and got to the bottom of why this is so, but both of them are definitely the most prominent from the kind of pre-Raphaelitist uh, circle. And um, I would say that Rossetti probably features more, obviously, in the literary articles as well. So in, in, you know, in my paper, I was working with this overlap of, of you know, artists, poets, uh, art critics, and, and literary authors kind of together creating this pre-Raphaelite uh, reflection uh, in, in, in Bohemia. But uh, with Rossetti, it would definitely be, um, you know, p people, poets that write about Rossetti, they don't necessarily write about Ben Jones. So I, I haven't come across a Czech poet, poet who would written... Uh, who would write a poem about Burne Jones or, or uh, you know, written poems about his work, for example, while they do so for Rossetti. Uh, so maybe that makes up for, you know, there would be naturally more exposure for Burne Jones because he was in Paris. You could see, you know, his work in Paris. Um, but obviously there was quite a lot of interest in Rossetti from the literary and, and poetic side. So maybe that could be um, a hint towards an answer, but we shall see. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Susie, Susie. <laughs> Hi, it's Susie Beckham. Hi. Um, so, my whole doctoral thesis essentially is on the pre flight label. So, I love this. This is great. Um, I guess, of just sort of responding to Sophie's prompt, I guess about this of the difficulty we have, I guess, with reconciling the pre flight label with, particularly with Rossetti, is because we get those kind of, you know, in the sixties and seventies, we kind of there's this sort of like influx of criticism about people being really critics being really frustrated with how the pre term terms been kind of floated around. The idea you've got this guy called Justin McCarthy writes for the Galaxy, and I think in '76, all about you know there's pre like women, there's now pre yeah, like the hair, there's pre like curtains, there's everything. Um, <laughs> so really, really frustrated with it. But then you've also got you know Dante Gabriel Rossetti. There's this, like story about like how supposedly he like once said like Madam, I'm not an item of any kind was very sort of, against the idea of being referred to as a pre like but then his brother was sort of, you know, would then also recall how Dante Gabriel seemed to have a lot of, like, you know, fondness for being a pre-athlete in his younger days. So we have this sort of, like, real difficulty, I guess, between kind of, like, negotiating where we kind of place the identity. And I think, 
certainly today, I think sort of the idea that Rossetti, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, is synonymous with the Perfect label now. So we've got this kind of this difficulty between the label both being fixed and unfixed. And I think it's the idea that kind of Perfectism is kind of, as a label, is kind of what people make of it, I guess. But so I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But yeah, I guess it's always, this will be an endless, I think, sort of conversation about how valuable that label is and how, how useful it is as a term when we look at Rossetti studies. But yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I don't know what my thoughts are either. I was with you, and I was with, I was fully, fully, I, your work sounds really wonderful, and I know you emailed me now a while ago, so I'm sure you're getting close uh, with your project. Um, I was with you up until you said um, pre raphaelitism is maybe what you make of it, because I actually don't agree with that. I do think it is a very period-specific term that, I, and maybe... I'll have a room of people that disagree with me. But prior to working at Delaware, I used to feel, and I don't know, maybe because I was a Tim student, that like a pre-Raphaelite purist. Like pre-Raphaelitism was the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood directly after. And I mean, and frankly, in, in Art for Art's Sake, in, in Liz's book, I thought that, that that book really helped me to like have sort of draw a line in the sand for when pre-Raphaelitism end and everything that came after it. But I feel that I've had to, I've had to just sort of, <laughs> <laughs> now that, you know, I have these hundreds of objects that are the Bancroft pre-Raphaelite collection and it's sort of Victorian miscellany, you know, that pre-Raphaelite needs to sometimes have this more expansive uh, definition, and I think it's our responsibility as as scholars and as curators to continue to push on that term in our work to to really um, not allow everything to be pre raphaelite hair, pre raphaelite curtains, pre raphaelite everything because there it was used very very specifically by the artist that came up with that term, and uh, I feel sort of a responsibility uh, to that original definition. It was a big trend. Yeah, absolutely a big trend. Yeah. That said, come to the pre Raphaelite weekend at Delaware Art Museum, <laughs> November 9th to 12th. This year. <laughs> okay, one last question. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? No, please go over <laughs> I'm president of the Pre-Raphaelite Society. I was just going to support what the lady at the back said. Pre-Raphaelites are the original Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. There was a second flowering that included Burne Jones. If I could tell you how many art dealers have contacted the PRS with paintings of women who've got red hair <laughs> or whatever, or there's a knight or whatever, can you name the specific pre-Raphaelite artist that painted this piece of art? It is ridiculous. Yeah. Pre-Raphaelite art, <laughs> the term needs to be really used properly. And guess what? William Morris fabric designs are not Pre-Raphaelite art. I don't care if they're on your mugs or your biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> are there biscuits? Are there biscuits on offer now? Yeah. <laughs> so, no. yeah. But the, the, it's the, the it's just well, just it's just the term, and it's just so sad. I don't need to say any more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think so that's a perfect <laughs> <laughs> final. <laughs> okay, oh. perfect conclusion, mm. and so. Thank you very much again, again for presenting three fantastic insights and demonstrating how uh, the Rossetti's uh, had a huge impact, but not only that, also the presence of Rossetti's on a global perspective allowed also interactions, interchanges, and considering the, the, the the, well, the title of this conference, Relations on a Global, not only in Britain, but also on a global perspective. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.